Hello and welcome everyone this evening. I am Michelle Tramble Spellman and I am interviewing tonight Robert and Michelle King, two of my favorite bosses. I joined <laughs> The Good Wife on season four and I was a super fan of the show and remained so while I was on it and I just want to get into talking to them. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And we know the credits, Good Wife, Good Fight, Evil, Brain Dead, and Your Honor, which they're the producers on, and Bite, The Bite, which is playing, is it playing right now on Charter Spectrum? You can find it uh, still on Charter Spectrum, yeah. It's already okay. aired. Okay, great. All right, we're gonna jump in here. So I have a couple of different things. We have the process questions, which I know everybody would wanna hear about, the hiring writers questions, and then just some of the generals. So I'm gonna start with the general. And one thing that um, I think about when I think about your shows is that how much you live in the real world with your narrative. And there's a lot of shows that live outside of what's actually happening in the world and yours is present and current and up to date. And what's that like for the creative process? And is that a big driving part of your decision when you decide to do a project? I would say on the good fight, it's been a savior, just mm -hmm. even personally and emotionally, especially uh, during the Trump presidency. It was just a godsend to be able to talk about that with a smart room of writers and kind of unload emotionally and then feel like, okay, I'm not procrastinating. This is actually work. And it's not, and is there anything that you've come across in current events that you were like, even that is too much of a hot potato or is it like, nope? <laughs> Very rarely. I think China, China for the entertainment business is a hot one that okay. we wrote about. And uh, some of it, as you, if you watch the episode, was censored, but some of it was, uh, at least the dramatic part, was allowed through. So I would say that everything else seems to be open. I mean, it's surprising how much we're kind of allowed to well, just pursue what you want. And so it's like, you know, so many of those. And you know, from The Good Wife, we really didn't get tackled even when we were on network. Right, right. Do you think that's because the show is so sophisticated and the audience itself is so sophisticated so they understand that it's more satire and commentary sometimes? Or do you feel like maybe the Kings were grandfathered in before this sort of <laughs> pitchfork moment that we're living in? <laughs> maybe a little bit of both. I also wonder sometimes if CBS has just gotten exhausted. <laughs> like, tired of fighting and we just don't want to bother fighting with us anymore. Uh, I think that's it, but I think it is about 50-50 of what you said. I mean, there uh, there is something that is a little heightened about the show, so it's not, it's not as easy to criticize because it sort of doesn't take one side of thing. It tries to take a few sides, and even then it takes a few sides of those sides, and so it, it kind of becomes a whole mirror that it's kind of hard to figure out, okay, what am I criticizing? I don't even know what they're <laughs> saying. I don't know what they're talking about. So I think that helps it. Uh, you know, I think there's a few times where small amounts of the content is taken out of context and shown online, and that kind of creates a little storm. But, um, you know, if, you, if anybody who watches the show just knows, okay, well, that was kind of just taken out of context. Right. And then I think also, just as a, a fan opinion, I think it's because the characters exist as more than just their opinions. And I think that sometimes you run into problems when you're watching TV or film where you feel like the characters are just a mouth, mouthpiece, but all of the characters that you write live so much in the gray area that they're not one or the other. So it doesn't feel mouthpiece at, at least to me. I'm glad. And also, I mean, the hope is that characters that one likes disagree with each other. Yeah. So that it's not always obvious what side the show is coming down on. I think the other thing that might help the show is it bounces around from so many topics mm -hmm. I mean, on one episode. So it's not like, oh, go punch a Nazi is the featured just, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> instruction of the show. There's some racial aspect that is the other. So I think because it's a juggling, it's juggling like four or five controversial concepts mm -hmm. that they're not, it's hard to say, oh, that's what the one I, that makes me upset. 
Okay. And then this is when I was um, in, I'd gone on vacation. I think when I was on Good Wife, it was between seasons and the influence when I was in the UK, anybody that I bumped into and Julia had the same thing where she stayed in an Airbnb and the woman was a super fan. So she spent every evening <laughs> discussing episodes with her while she was on vacation. And have you seen the good wife influence? Can you recognize it in other shows or things that you've watched? Because I could see it sometimes. Uh, for me, rarely. I, You know what? There was a, a a friend recently sent me a, a little blurb of a book that's coming out. Uh, and I think it's about first ladies and why did they stand by their man? And there was a drawing on the front and the woman was in a red dress. And I thought, okay, that, <laughs> that, that is a callback, but yeah. not, that, not that much. Okay, I have two ways that I think we've influenced culture. One is by the name of the good, the uh -huh. good doctor, the, everything the good has come after us. <laughs> Started that so, and they're going back and retitling shows like The Good Sopranos. I think is going to be. <laughs> and the second thing is Bitcoin. I think we were one of the first ones. You were in. Were you in the room then? I mean, maybe. Mm -hmm. in the, yeah, Bitcoin. Uh, mostly uh, because of one of the writers who was interested was eight dollars a Bitcoin when we started. Now it's like fifty thousand dollars per Bitcoin. And a lot of the people who are speculators of Bitcoin either heard about it through our show or heard about the, through the show when it was discussed on Reddit. So um, there we go. We didn't get a, any of it. I was going to say, Corinne brought that in, if you'll remember. Corinne, yes. And we thought about giving a Bitcoin to every writer for Christmas. And I think we instead went for puffy jackets. <laughs> uh, perhaps that wasn't the right choice. <laughs> I know that the, um, let me think. So is there an episode, if you think about all the hours of television that you've done, Good Wife, Good Fight, Evil, is, that, is there one that you could identify as the one you're most proud of? There is there was anything little, that sticks out? I know for me. I bet we have the same one. Uh, There's a Good Wife episode in the fifth season called Hitting the Fan, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. which I thought was action packed and had a lot of emotional punch. And it just felt like it never let up. It was a uh, about the uh, it was about the breakup of the law firm. Oh yeah, it felt mm -hmm. like um, you know it was one. It was an episode you would do once, but it also it was a episode that didn't lie on its laurels. It kind of kept moving and kept creating new permutations. And I just very much and I love Juliana Margulies's work in it, and I love Chris Nose's work. I mean, it's really. I think everybody was on the top of the game, including Josh Charles, who did a nice job. Yeah, James Whitmore directed it. And uh, it was one of those things where, as it was going, I kept thinking, well, why, why don't they all work this well? <laughs> <laughs> you know, why, why isn't the editing so smooth and the acting so right and the casting beautiful? You know, it's just, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> it's a little frustrating, but yeah. Are you still surprised that we were able to pull off the Will episode? I am surprised because, uh, I mean, I think a lot of things have gotten worse since then about the way that it's, everything's leaked. Mm -hmm. But even then I remember, and I, I think, I mean, Lost had a lot of struggles with it, that things were leaked. And I don't think anybody thought, oh my God, what are they gonna reveal on Good Wife next week? <laughs> no one kind of went there. so. And Lori Metros, who's uh, the publicity person at CBS, and David Staff, who heads up CBS TV, really made an effort. And then we thought that morning because. Uh, was it Osceola? Somebody yeah, had. Yeah, but also I think it was re accidentally revealed at where did they go and in come like, from I away? See. No, the other place, Newfoundland, yeah. something or other. <laughs> they revealed it there and it was starting to hit online, but they were able to squash it. So. Um, okay. I mean, obviously the show isn't built to be uh, a stunner every, or even every week or even once three, every three years. <laughs> it's supposed to be water cooler. What are they gonna do next? Oh my God. Uh, I remember watching on real time. Uh, I just went and I just had Twitter and I was watching on real time and it was such an experience because the shock level and then right afterwards that's when you know we all start getting text messages from our family and friends like what just happened what did you do it was all accusatory both our mothers were so mad oh, no. 
my sister called and when I answered the phone, she hung up on me. <laughs> Didn't even talk. <laughs> I was just like, oh my goodness. Um, who do you think is the actor whisperer between the two of you? You. And I was gonna say you. No, you because, uh, well, <laughs> Malcolm, when I interviewed him for something, kept saying, I got to talk to you about this later. <laughs> so I don't want to keep doing that. But uh, there were actors that I thought were difficult. And we did not have a difficult time with the rewrites. There was no kind of, what the hell? Why am I saying this? And I thought it was because Michelle found a very good, uh, I thought you found a very good level with some of the leads where it wasn't a problem. And, and we've probably gotten lucky with our actors that they typically trust the material. Mm -hmm. so we haven't gotten a lot of what the hell, this is garbage. I mean, you, you see interviews with other actors on other shows and they're so dismissive of the writing. Yeah. You know, you feel horrible for, the, for those writers and showrunners. And I think that's more likely in a 22 episode a year or 23 episode a year format because the actors are exhausted. I mean, yeah. I think this whole eight episodes and 10 episodes is not as hard as when we were doing that. Can you see yourselves ever going and doing 22 uh -oh. again? No, nope, uh -oh. it's done. Although this last year we said we're never doing 22 or 23 an episode a year and we ended up doing 29 between the three shows. Oh God. So that was not very smart. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know we used uh, Chum Home on Truth Be Told? <laughs> and I know that when Ted did his show, he used it also. <laughs> so there's always these little Easter eggs to the show out there. <laughs> okay, so here's some uh, process questions, and then I'll look at some of the Q and A's that we're getting. Outline or no outline? Uh, wait. When we're a writers' room. We, uh, we spend a lot of time in the build of the episode. Mm -hmm. But I, the build of this episode is not really an outline. It is a board that has all the beats with just headlines of what that beat is. Then the writer who's going to write that episode goes off and writes an outline, but we don't go to the studio with it because we really don't want to be, I mean, it's, it's terrible to say this, but we don't want to be noted to death mm -hmm. prior to the script. Uh, I think it was that way when you were doing, but I think it's more about the build than the outline because the outline has too much verbiage in it. What more I think you want to look is a very simple look at the skeleton of the structure. And I think um, uh, the DreamWorks people, uh, Walter Parks and Laurie McDonald, Laurie McDonald uh, really taught a very simple way of structuring, which was think of you know each of these beats, which aren't that many, as headlines as if they're on a news article. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you're not getting pregnant with what all the complications of what that beat mean. You're just trying to see what happens that is going to change the nature of the plot. Mm -hmm. Also, the South Park guys think that way. And mm -hmm. I think it's a very helpful way to not be seduced by your own writing, mm -hmm. but only look at the bare skeleton. So we do that in the room. We create a simple of, uh, you know, if you're looking at a card and you're across the room, you should be able to read it because there's not that much writing on it. It is a headline for what that beat is. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, what I would say, is it. And, but again, these do not get turned into the studio. Yeah. Which we, I, we had to do that whole kabuki through the first four seasons of Good Wife. Then we got them to say, yeah, no, it's fine. So we haven't had to do it on Evil or uh, Good Fight. Right, just an arena document. What about you? What do you do? We do an arena document and then we do a beat sheet, but no thorough outline just because I feel like the story loses some of its magic in noting the outline and trying to get the outline right that you're spending so much time on that then it, it loses some of that texture and, and surprise that you that's in script sometime. Do you think, um, or do you find, there's some writers that I've worked with and some that I know this to be true that, they realize what they want after they see what they don't want. Is there any like truth to that? Like once it comes off the board and it starts to live and breathe, it's like, ah, that's not quite it, but it's close and go back in there. Well, uh, 
uh, the, the writers, uh, the difficulty often you gum off the board and you start writing it and you go, oh, that was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you see it's actually executed, you see what a bad idea it is. And at that point, un unfortunately, you're like five days away from prep. So often, it, or not often, I would say 30% uh, of the time, 20% of the time, we'll go back to the room and say, we need to rebuild this part of the thread because we thought that would work and it did. And, by, and sometimes, by the way, you know, you, the, the concept is build logically right intuitively you know build logically that this is something that you could see as a sturdy foundation but when you're writing you write that intuitively because things that might have been dead on the board come to life when you write them but sometimes things that are dead on the board or if things are alive on the board are dead when you write so often you're returning so if that's the question i think we return maybe 20 percent of the time to rebuild some thread so what was, you know, I don't think I've ever known this. What was your first TV writing job? It was Injustice. Okay. Uh, which uh, had Jason Amara starring and Kyle McLaughlin. Okay. We had written. For ABC. We had done some unsuccessful pilots prior to that. Uh, three or four. Three or four. Uh, we had almost like the, I think we were, um, you know, a pet over at ABC for a while, where they would say, oh, here's some money, now write a pilot for us this year, but nothing really went. And um, we enjoyed the process, you enjoyed the process more than me, because you like affirm, okay, we're not doing this, or we're- Back when TV was actually TV, and hadn't turned into the feature business yet. Right. 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 So what, so you had a feature, you, there was a feature career, and then you transitioned into television. I had a feature career uh, as a writer, as a writer mm -hmm. and, and I was working as a reader and in development. Okay. And then when we started, we all have only done TV together, but I did, um, I worked, I started with Roger Corman movies. I did three for him. And then um, we started writing specs and did a comedy and a courtroom drama and a, and a uh, mountain climbing movie. And, um, you know, that's when there were more movies that could come from specs or from independents, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, independent writers. Um, it's, uh, I think we flipped over into TV at almost the exact correct time. We got very fortunate in our timing. And do you, um, and what made you make the transition to TV? Uh, a director I had worked with on a movie called Speechless, his name is Ron Underwood, came to us and said, let's do a pilot, let's do a series together. And we've uh, said, well, there was a movie Michelle and I were gonna write about crime on the border between Tijuana and San Diego. And we thought, well, why don't we see if anybody wants that as a series because it has crime in it. You know, you're always looking for the things that you think the buyer wants mm -hmm. that can still settle what you wanna do. So we went there and um, it, it it was, it was a very successful pitch experience. <laughs> three, three different places wanted it and we sold it. And we were so excited through the process and we felt so very brave because it was so uh, much about, you know, it was about two worlds, the San Diego world and the Tijuana world. And it had a lot of diverse cast. There was not a single white man in the show. <laughs> <laughs> and then it came time for them to green light it and everyone looked up and said, there's not a single white man in the show. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was, I mean, it was, it was so exciting up to the point that it was soul crushing. Uh, but even that's better than development hell in movies, which yeah. is soul crushing, soul crushing, soul crushing. Oh, your movies in the theaters. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, uh, it was good to be exciting. And then, oh yeah, they're not going to do it and you're done. And now you have to pitch the next thing. What did you take from the experience of injustice to Good Wife? Like, did, I feel like I've learned a lot from Truth Be Told. It will be different on the next show. What was the biggest thing that you took between the two? We were uh, married with a, a, an experienced showrunner. And um, the, there was a, a feeling we were being deferential to a fault. Mm -hmm. because we didn't know what is TV and if there's any um, 
thing anybody wants to learn from this, never be deferential. Go for your what you believe is the show and argue for it and don't dick around because there was a lot of dithering. Because, creatively different. Creatively. Not, it's not about, you know, politeness. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't, because there's a lot of creative dithering if there's not someone who knows what they're after because everybody is kind of wanting to protect their job in some way. Mm -hmm. So I think what was helpful to us in the next experience is go, we're getting older. Either we say, this is what we want to do, or we should get out of the business and go do something else. Um, so I think that's a helpful thing. If anybody can get past that, oh, I shouldn't even be here. I'm not even sure what I, you know, let the smarter people of TV handle things. It's like, no, there are no smarter people in TV. They're, you're the smartest person in TV because you have the story that they want and you have the story and you know what it's about. And the smarter in TV will turn it into something else that is not as good. So what, so what ways do you think that the feature business has seeped in the TV? Oh, schedule. I mean, uh, and and a, a land grab by directors. Be, that can be because suddenly with fewer episodes that, and the rise of the mini room that people think, well, I'm just going to pay less to writers and they're going to get all the scripts done. It's the worst fiction in the world that it could work this way. Right. And that then they're done. And then we'll let the grownups, i.e. the director, take it over and turn it into art. And uh, I think that's very much to the detriment of, of the process. We've had a really good opportunity to make the process much faster, mm -hmm. especially on Good Fight. It's supposed to be contemporary. So we write it as we're showing them. Mm -hmm. And the faster the process, the more they rely on the showrunner. And the, right. you know, the bottom line is you, I mean, you know this on Good Wife, you basically have final cut. I mean, mm -hmm. as the showrunner, because there's no time for anybody to question and go back to the drawing board on anything. I right. mean, obviously not all the episodes turn out perfect, but perfect again is the enemy of the good. And as you see in movies, they're, they're sweating over every frigging detail of it that to the point where the show seems to almost lose all its breath, lose all its... So anyway, we enjoy the panic of the process because the process seems to lend more to the showrunner's talent the, the quicker it needs to be done. Okay, that's perfect. And that's true. When there's a lot of um, lag time, then it's like, you know, the joke that's funny on Monday, it's not funny by Friday because everybody has their, their hands in the pot there and they, they've spent too much time with it. And wow. Michelle, sorry. No, and I was going to say, and one is worse off, and Michelle, you're going to know this better than I do. Uh, the fewer projects that the executives have, the worse off it is, the, the more it's like the feature business that they suddenly have far too much time to doubt you and prove, you know, hold on to their jobs and uh, it can be a problem. And you probably looked at an old script or someone who's watching and should look back at an old script. The first joke was the best. Yeah. <laughs> For whatever reason, intuitively, that joke that fit in like a puzzle piece was the one that worked. And every time you sweat it over it and sweat it over it, you made it a little more like something somebody else wanted. And so anyway, we found a process that works for us and the process means we're doing it fast. Yeah, okay. And then um, have you looked back on any of your old projects and thought, God, that's worth revisiting? You know, it, it's funny. I, I have, but it's, but then you actually pull the script out. Actually, it's have not you looked at the line? Because I think the line would be good. I haven't looked at the line, but I have looked at a couple others and think, oh, it's not, you know, we've written a, literally 150 episodes of television since then. It's not as good. <laughs> it's not as good, the, the yeah. earlier ones. Yeah. I mean, we had a, a script that was like The Bridge, Elwood Reads, you know, and this was the one that was set at the Tijuana border. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I bet if we looked at that, that might be interesting, but you're right. <laughs> so here's another process question. It, do you start with theme or does the theme emerge? There was one season we started with theme on Good Wife and that was Kalinda having, 
a husband. <laughs> and it was a disaster. So ever since we've never really started with him. We we you know your left hand shouldn't know what your right hand's doing. Like maybe we'll write it down somewhere. We're doing this on evil now. We got a theme in mind, but then you better friggin' forget it pretty quick because if you're following theme, it just doesn't live. It doesn't. Um, I mean, do you disagree? No, I think theme is a word we almost never mention in the room. I'm curious, mm -hmm. do you? No, but I get asked that by execs all the time and by producers all the time. And I was like, we don't know yet. We'll know as it starts to emerge and we feel, and we'll, we'll, we'll recognize it when we see it, but we don't start with the theme is, and then break the season. No. No, right? Yeah. That I mean, it's really artificial. Yeah. Probably what you need is somebody in your back pocket to just tell them like this year it's about hunger it's about food <laughs> and then you know something that's a little bit ambiguous because it it satisfies their needs mm -hmm. but it really is a danger i think it's a danger yeah malcolm's point of view is that all they're looking for is the sound bite that they could send up the food yeah. chain 100%. and so sometimes and that's what your aunt that's the question and that's what you what you want, you know, want to give them something that they could take up from there. Well, can does, I ask, does he have one that he, he uses for every show? He 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 mixes it up, but I listen to him on his calls and I'm like, that's really good. I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> I will say, because you know, when you're show running, you do a show and tell of what the look of the show is, mm -hmm. and you usually have the DP there, whoever's directing the first episode. I think theme is helpful there because then you can tell that the visuals fall into that theme and it gives them something to hold on to. But then I think it should never be mentioned to the writers and it should be forgotten fairly quickly. But if every department knows, you know, I think with Good Wife in the original, it was, this is a formal, very straight laced world with glass and a lot of red. Mm -hmm. And it's really about the blood sport of the law. If you go that route, they kind of get it. Um, but then you better not say it ever again to anyone else. <laughs> right. I think the thing is, is that I don't, it's not theme necessarily with me, but there's usually a question that I want to answer. A question of either about a, the character or a subject or something like that. With truth be told, the idea was we look at true crime as if these people weren't real, that they were characters and they're fictional. But what does this look like on the other side of the families that are um, exposed in this way? So that was the question that I used for the room and to get everything going. But theme, it always comes out uh, at the end. So do you think you have a consistent inspiration is it current events music other art forms or a hodgepodge is there one thing that sort of gets the creative juices flowing for you i would say it's panic but what would you say writer <laughs> <laughs> uh, wise ben hecht uh who was a uh, uh, i mean everyone no one knows who that is but he was a writer who, who started writing right around the silent era and wrote 30s a lot of the romantic comedies and you know he was ba basically Patty Chayesky before it became pretentious. So <laughs> it's about being unpretentious and being funny about subjects that are serious. And back to Ben Heck. And he was a very much like, I'm going to do 12 projects at once and I'm going to, you know, not treat him like I'm, you know, curing cancer. I mean, he was just having fun. And yet he was very cynical and satirical. And the satire was folded into other things that movies can do for you either romantic comedy or historical drama or whatever he uh, you know probably his famous movie is notorious the hitchcock movie but mm -hmm. he's done almost every movie from scarface the original scarface on he was the center of the creative impulse um i would say that i mean you know from good wife it was always music we were always mm -hmm. trying to find some musical angle I can't think of any. And else. current events. Uh, yeah. Oh, right. I mean, depending on the show, but yeah, that yeah. certainly influences. What Maybe I'm more saying. good fight on that front than good wife, certainly, because, yeah. you know, it was so came out of anger and being disturbed by how weird the world was getting. So. Yeah. Well, you knew something was coming because <laughs> look where we ended up. <laughs> it's just got nuttier and nuttier so when you're hiring writers and you're looking to staff your room do you prefer to read originals or specs they're showrunners either fought, seem to fall on one side or the other you know what all i get these days are originals i i haven't seen 
a spec show in maybe eight years. Oh, wow. Okay. And is that good or bad? You, you know, I never minded specs. I, I know some people uh, were very dismissive of them. I thought they were just fine, but I don't get them anymore at all. Do you, and sorry, and so now typically I get original um, pilots, teleplays, or because we're staffing New York rooms typically, uh, I get more plays, which is fine too. Do you get and novels? do you do you get a good indication of what the playwrights will be like in the room? Because there 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 are two different you know skill sets and hats, and they mesh. But do you feel like you could do a whole room of playwrights, or you need that combination of some vet TV writers in there? Uh, my preference is certainly to have vets. Mm -hmm. but, but but that said a lot, I mean, because we have New York rooms, a lot of the people that have been doing TV for a while also are very firmly identified as playwrights. Okay. Self-identified. And what do you think is the key to room chemistry? We had such a great room on, uh, on Good Wives the, the four years I was there. It was adult and respectful and creative and really funny, really funny people in that room. Yeah. But do you think that there's like a key to the chemistry? Uh, I would say alcohol, yeah. alcohol and drugs. <laughs> Friday margaritas. Yeah, we did. <laughs> uh, I, you know, a little bit of it is luck, but also trying to be really clear up front that you are looking for folks that listen as well as they speak and recognize that they are meant to be collegial and, and that's, that's part of the job. And, and also calling around for references mm -hmm. and, you know, and listening to that. I, I mean, what, what, did, what is your experience with it in hiring? Well, the references and the references that come not from the showrunner, but the other writers that they were in the room with, because what I found is that the room has two different personalities, the personality of the room when the showrunner is there and then the one when they're gone. And so it was a, a, a little bit more of an indication to me if I called someone who was just across the table from the writers to ask about them. Smart. I do think it's helpful if the showrunner sets the tempo for listening. Because I do think, um, I always was aware of, because uh, everybody likes to hear themselves talk. Uh, but as a showrunner, if someone accidentally talked over you, I would always shut up and let them talk and not barrel over. Because I think that just sets the idea that listening is as strong of a, an exercise in the room as talking. Um, I think that was it. I don't think of anything else. I do think um, we probably set the tempo of talking about just life for about the first 20 minutes to a half hour, which mm -hmm. is always helpful and not feel like you have your nose to the grind. So we would rarely, and you know this, rarely split up the room. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always better when the room was together than, oh, you four are going off here, you four are going off here. And I think our room was always seven people, seven or eight people. Yeah. yeah, it was small and, and manageable. And there was just a, 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 so, a tone set from the top about respect and collaboration. And I recognized that on the first day where it was just, you know, someone would pitch, people would talk. But when either of you talk, you would always say, oh, Ted, I think that you said something earlier or Keith or Erica. And it was just that acknowledgement. And that seems small to you. That's huge for the writers at the table and everybody else followed suit because it's like you're being recognized for your ideas and your pitches and it teaches the rest of the room to do the same without it being a, a list of rules on the board and so I've adopted that and the rest of the room picks it up very quickly. One other thing which um, I think is being falling out of fashion the more feature writers are coming over to tv I think showrunners are taking credit more uh, which yeah. is I think a nasty habit to start because it actually, it, it, I mean, John Wells talked to us, about, we talked to Vince Gilligan and John, John Wells about how to run a room. And it always felt like the problem is you were, as a showrunner, you were into it for yourself and not for the betterment of the scripts in the room. So mm -hmm. I do think that is a mistake that showrunners In are, terms of putting one's name on the script. Yeah, I'm sorry, in taking mm -hmm. credit for the script 
when in, in, in fact, that literal sense, when they're just doing a showrunner or producer's function, they're taking, they're then they're competing with their writers, mm -hmm. which I think is always a mistake and will always come back and bite you in the ass. Yeah, and it and it the room gets demoralized after a while. And then you just feel like then people are sitting at the table to get the paycheck and not because they're excited or inspired by the creativity and the collaboration there. Is there anything that you found like a common denominator for the writers that do well in your rooms? You know, I mean, they're all smart. Mm -hmm. They're, they're all collegial. I, you know, no one. There's not as much competition in pitching. If someone thinks, oh, my pitch, why did they shoot that down? And they're always wanting to reassert it, that that was a good. So not to take any ego attached to an idea that may have been shot down or be proud of one that was used, that, you know, <clears throat> the more everybody wins, with whatever premise comes, because something that's shot down on Tuesday is used again on Friday. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and uh, I think uh, when someone doesn't get their nose out of joint with the process of the room, that's always seems to be best. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we, I can't recall if we were doing it this way on Good Wife when you were on the staff, but we shifted over to every script being group written. Yes, when I came back the last season. Okay, yeah. and we've continued that. And I think it's worked out well, not just in terms of the end result, which I think works out, but also for the writers in the room that no one feels terrible, the amount of rewriting that happens to the script because you know everyone's in it together. And they also feel invested in every episode because they've, been responsible for seeing. I hate to bring up a reality show regarding this, but if you want to see about the politics of room, you want to be a showrunner, watch Survivor and watch <laughs> the politics of Survivor about a group dynamic. And yeah. how if someone leaves the group, they are either talked about or worried they're being talked about. There's always this tendency that the group means less when one person is away or two people are away. So I do think Survivor is a very good education in room dynamics. It, it totally is. The one thing that I always say when young writers say, well, what is the first, the best piece of advice that you got for, you know, your first job? And I was like, do not let your room or your office be the place where people close the door and complain. So if you're, don't ever, ever, ever do that. And if you feel like that's happening, then it's easy to open your door, move the conversation in the kitchen and people can't whisper there you know, if you don't have the kind of personality where you could say, stop, don't talk to me about these things, just the subtle way, move it to the kitchen. Now it's all out in the public. They can't keep talking shit that could get you in trouble. So if there's something that you like um, want to tell young writers coming into your room that they should know. Uh, before you First say all, that, that's someone. A great piece of advice. Someone <laughs> asked, does that mean seven writers were credit per episode? And that didn't. Everybody got an episode that was theirs. Everybody drew up what they wanted. And then they were the organizer of how it was group written, who would write what. And then there was a week or a half week where that writer collected that those pages and actually did a major polish on it to make it all one voice. And then Michelle and I would do our polish, but that was the nature of it. Yeah. Just so everyone. And so there was only one writer's name per script. And that writer was responsible, even though there was group writing prior to it. Okay, let's see. There's, I think we have a bunch of questions coming in now. And I don't want everyone to leave without, let's see. So uh, Linda wants to know about mentorship. How important do you think that, is that an important part of the showrunner's job to you? Or is there just no time for that? Or do you try to mentor on each show? Um. It's a difficult one because um, I would say, uh, and I don't remember this was the case with you, but our editing rooms are under the same roof as the writer's room. And um, all the writers were welcome to sit in any moment they wanted where they weren't in the writer's room to be in the editing room. When there was that, what I would, that is, I, by the way, 
more than important than even being on the set is being in the editing room to see how a rewriting goes on through what is included in an episode and what is not. Because Good Wife, Good Fight, Evil, we overwrite by about 15%. And always it's about how do you get down to the best performances? How do you go down to the, how is a line falling flat? Because we don't do uh, uh, readings. What do they call those? Script readings. We don't have the actors read out loud through the script because it's a visual medium and it always seems like bullshit because you're going to hate things if you just hear it and don't see it. A table read. A table read. We never do that because these aren't stage plays. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're most supposed to be visual. So what we do is have, um, you know, it's always in the editing room. You go, oh, that line just didn't hit at all. So you're finding ways to. So I would say that's the mentorship. I don't. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, if we're really honest with ourselves, the mentorship is is passive. It is, mm -hmm. it is not active, really. But it's it's learning active. because you're there in the room and writing and learning from the other writers, but not an active, let's sit down every week and this is what you need to do. But you're just by osmosis, you're being mentored. A, a bit. Yeah. And then, so there was something that I did on Truth Be Told, and I can't remember if we did this on Good Wife, but I included the editors of the episode in the tone meetings. So they would kind of know, yeah. Did you find that to be helpful? Yes, uh, more in the tone meeting than the concept meeting. The tone meeting, um, uh, partly because uh, the tone meeting is telling the director what is working this year and what is not. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, often what is not working is one actor is having problems with this kind of emotion. It comes across screechy or whatever. And the editor can say, what I've been doing in the editing room to get around it is this, this, this. Then the director is aware who they are giving the images to that, you know, and what we would love three takes on, not one take on usually. Uh, mm -hmm. There were some directors who would do a one or, you know, a shot, a scene with one angle and they do it in one take. And it's like the editor was very clear, no, if you're doing a one or we're not against it, especially if it's a short half page scene, mm -hmm. but you really need to do three to four takes of it so we know. Um, and also there's tricks that we use in the editing room. Usually we, we do what we call a shadow monster, but it's a foreground cross that we plant in there to hide a cut because you may want to cut from one take to another take, but not bounce around. So in other words, it's really having good, it's good for the editor to talk to the director to what we do different. Okay. We had the, um, we set, when I did the tone meeting with the director where we went scene by scene for emotional content, what's important in this scene, the um, editor started sitting with us. So there was another person to get it at the end when they were cutting that scene together. Oh, it was really important that we get this piece because as you know, the directors have moved on. And, you know, you're pulled in so many different directions. I know that you guys were able to do a lot more editing than I was able to do because I was just, you know, um, on set. But what was the, what was, what was it like the first time that you directed an episode? Um, I got to tell you, it's the most fun in the world. It's more fun than anything else you'll do. I, because I like quartering people around. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, if you're in the editing or a lot and it's another director and you go, oh my God, why didn't they get that shot? Why didn't they, you know, you're always like pulling your hair out and you're always kind of hitting your head against the wall. And then you are humbled because you yourself do the same fucking thing because there's the pressure of time. I and mean, we're not Ridley Scott, who's got 20 cameras and all the time in the world. We are, you know, at the most, you may have two, maybe three characters, but usually one, and there's a limited time. And you're always humbled when you see it. Um, I would say, you know, it's ghastly when you see your first cut. It's really, I can't even watch cuts. I just have to start over. Okay, we're not gonna watch this. We're gonna start over and look at, you know, and go scene by scene, because at least then I only see part of the, the, you know, the handicapped elephant instead of the full elephant going, I have no idea. And so the thing to do is rip it all out if you take it piece by piece. So um, it's the most fun in the world though. Obviously showrunners should do it. Showrunners should always do it because it will tell you 
how the process works from beginning to end mm -hmm. that well and how it works poorly and you were humbled constantly by it. Have it you ever by the better makes you a better showrunner in the room, I think, if you know all the way things can go wrong. Okay. So. That's in and have you ever shoot, I had a um this is what's happening now that I've reached 50. I have a good question and it goes whoop, right out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing there, I'm gonna I'll give you something so you can, you know, <laughs> uh, which is that uh, especially showrunners towards the beginning of their career, figure out that the episode for them to direct is the last one of the season. Okay. Because otherwise they're still should be in the room breaking and writing. So that's the one where there's an opportunity for them to direct. And there's a, um, so there were a couple of questions that I see come up here about that group writing process. And just to, just for clar clarification, to break it down a little bit more so everyone could understand, the episode is broken by the entire room with the cards on the board. You, uh, the two of you come in and bless the episode so it could come off the board. The writer of that episode then does the beat sheet or whatever else and then decides, hey, Michelle, can you do the Diane scenes or can you do act one? And Keith, can you do this one? And then they all come in to the writer of record on that episode. They sort of Frankenstein it together, get rid of redundancies, make it make sense, do their pass and then kick it up the chain to the two of you. Correct. Okay. And I think what usually works is there, if there's something in law involved, the lawyer will handle it. Mm -hmm. If there's something an obsession with the A plot, if there was an obsession with the B plot, everybody finds their own affinity or can argue for their own affinity in that script. It, it, look, I don't think it's the, I don't know what the perfect process is, but you're when you're working on the gun and need to get things out, it feels like a good process for collegiality because it bring, it keeps the room intact. Because mm -hmm. one of the problems we always found was room decay. When the room, when a writer's out of the room, it just the energy, Mm -hmm. you know the energy just declines um so anyway we found it was not something we developed it was something one of our writers thought was a better way craig, to go craig turk, was craig the turk. One, was the mm -hmm. one I and i think it uh, we've used it since because it, it's just a way to keep the room as one cohesive clump that works together and i i'm going to embroider on a question that you asked prior which is about having a good culture in the room and a good feeling in the room. Part of that is being able to tell the writers when you are interviewing with them exactly what to expect. Mm -hmm. So to be able to say, you're going to be rewritten and yeah. you're going to be rewritten drastically. And I completely understand if that is not comfortable for you and that isn't the show you want to be on but that's what this show is. So everyone knows walking into the door what they're getting involved with. I think that makes a huge difference. And now, I, have you had writers say, okay, then this is not for me? Never. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, I then feel good about it because they've been really well warned and, uh, and then no one is resentful. Right, and no or, surprises. At least they don't. Um, let us know that they're resentful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Let me see. Oh, this is a good one from Brian. What types of talent pipelines, writer, director, crew, and actor do you use beyond the Viacom CBS one? Any not profits and programs or anything else? How are you finding your talent beyond, you know, who CBS recommends or agents? I would say we get nothing from CBS at this point, virtually. I mean, that that's that really hardly happens at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you remember the ATA fight with the agents. Right. When every, every writer fired their agent, we got the most diverse and youngest room when we did that because we were getting recommendations from other showrunners, from you, from Malcolm, from like a dozen other people we knew. And like, there were a lot of people they were reading that they had no room for on their show and they were suggesting it to others. And uh, from other writers on our shows, we checked room with them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the relationships after a while. It like is. You start to know a, a, a quite a few people. There was a, no name and names, 
but there was a younger uh, person in the room so that we really can't identify who was having a little bit of an uh, attitude problem. And I asked them if they wanted to go on a walk. And I said, you're showing nine people that you they will not want to bring you along because what you forget in the room is that all those writers are going to either have their own show or go to another show so you're maintaining you're managing relationships around the table not just up to the two showrunners that was a generous thing for you to say (laughs) michelle you gave me some of the strongest advice when i started um for truth be told you said when you interview people have a man in the room and it will tell you a lot about the person that you're meeting with if they only talk to the guy. And it was so true. And it just, it just cut through so much. But yes. And I said that and uh, uh, Liz and Sarah who do Happier in Hollywood were like, oh, we're going to do that from now on. (laughs) I think Ted was the person who was in there when I met with, with you. bumps the women it's the guys that get tripped up <laughs> yeah. um here's a question can you comment on when you think it's too late for a woman writer to p- pursue a career as a tv writer starting as a writer's assistant or otherwise is age a factor that could get in the way no uh, we've we've never I, I mean we've had writers in their frank pearson 70s. was the oldest Frank Pearson was, I think, 80. I, I was going to say, we've. Was he, he was, he was in, I, I thought he was because it was he, four years he before may, he died. He may have been in the 80s. Anyways, um, we have not had issues with age in our rooms. I mean, we've had writers that were 30, and we've had writers who had children that were 30. So it, and, and I, to my mind, it absolutely benefits the show to have uh, a great range in every room of mm-hmm. life experiences. Although the question was also asking a write, as a writer's assistant, do you think you're penalized if you're coming as a writer's assistant on the older side? No. I don't think so either, but I'm trying to think. I mean, obviously we don't know what every showrunner would do, but mm-hmm. I don't think so. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it might be, it's tough to break in when you're young too. So I yeah. have to say. Yeah, and I think there's a little bit where it just kind of, everybody is in their vague forties for a while. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you don't quite imitate and the birthday cakes don't have numbers and no one asks. <laughs> Let's see. Um, all right, let me see. By the way, while you're looking, I wouldn't mind saying um, when we were saying who you know and that's who you check, is this writer good or is that writer good? One thing that is helpful is I find most showrunners, even if you don't know them, if you call them up, either through their agent or whatever, they're incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. Not everyone, but most showrunners. I mean, there were a lot of people we didn't know that we just called out of the blue because it was a writer on their staff. And, you know, we would get you know, a, a long uh, dissertation on what he, th- he or she thought of that right. There's a lot of professional courtesy there. People that you mm-hmm. know are so busy that are still willing to get back to you quickly and, and give you a candid response. I, I'm assuming you found the same thing, Michelle. Yeah, the thing, whenever I reach out and say, hey, I'm uh, meeting with the Sprite, I'd love to hear your thoughts. If I get a call me, it's almost never good. You know, if the if the if it comes back, because it's like no one wants to put it in writing, so it has to be a verbal conversation, and that tells you more than anything, you know, right away. Um, and there was a great question. I have one here. What did you find most difficult when you first start show writing? I would say the multitasking. Yeah. Um, especially when you're doing a show where you're doing the tri level part of it at the same time, writing, writers' room or no, four level, writing, writer's room, production, and editing. That always, uh, the multitasking starts driving you crazy. And then what about the managing of personalities? Um, We had, I'll say this, the first year of show running is your worst year, always. We had a very (laughs) great first year of show running. 
and the personalities. We did not have uh, it down yet how we were hiring. There were some probably personalities that didn't work out together. And I would say that was difficult. It was almost like, I think Bill Prady calls it that you're, you know, right, trying to write War and Peace as you're managing three 7-Elevens in the Valley. You know? <laughs> so you're called out by 2 a.m. <laughs> That's the perfect description. Yeah. So here's a question. Um, how do you manage all your shows? What does your day look like now with so many shows and keeping track of what's going on at Evil while Good Fight and then everything else? Uh, there's a fair amount of divide and conquer. We also have Liz Glotzer, who runs our production company, who shoulders a lot of the producing duties and she and I talk at least four times a day. So there's, there's just a lot of exchanging information and just trying to keep all the balls moving in the right direction. I would say what you're always trying to do is put one show as most prominent, like right now it's evil because the writer's room started a week ago. But at the same time, Michelle's hiring writers for your honor we start the Good Fight Writers Room in January. Um, and we're kind of writers room nuts. We don't like leaving the writers room. We like being in there. So I would say because of Zoom, we're able to do two writers rooms at the same time with oh, difficulty. Wow. Um, you start the day with one and then you move on to the next. So do you have one room that meets in the morning and the other room at night or are they simultaneous? Or the afternoon. Uh, no, they're they're morning and night. But we only do a four outer room. Oh, great. Yeah, because it is. But right now we only have the one, and we're doing post production on the last season of Evil, which is the mix. The visual effects are are caught in. You're always spending a lot of time on visual effects. Okay, and then here was one. I think this is our last one. Um, mentoring advice about how to behave in a room for new writers coming into a room. What are some of the things that they could avoid? Uh, being negative towards other people's ideas. You don't want to be the person who's always um, be, you know, contradicting other people's pitches. I don't think you want to be the political police either. You don't want to be the one always schooling the showrunner. I mean, choose your battles on that stuff. I think improv is a very good lesson, the yes and in improv, which is the best way to criticize and yet push the uh, work forward is say yes to that, but you might, or and do this. Mm -hmm. So I think the yes and is a way to go. Um, you know, usually whatever political issues are handled by people who are more senior in staff, it's not that the political issues aren't important. They're just usually handled by someone who's pretty further up the food chain. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Let's see. That was fun. That breezed by. I miss you guys. Miss, we you. miss you, Michelle. It was, really, it was really nice. So um, I think that I was looking at the chat and looking at the Q&A. And hopefully we covered a lot of this. Uh, hold on. Is that wrong? Would you be willing to mentor? Oh, mentor me. Uh, the problem is we have everybody who's shadowing this year happening now. There's a lot of requests fairly early on. Whenever you try to ask someone, ask them fairly early on in their, uh, when you find out their schedule. Uh, the casting is amazing. It's all Mark Sachs. We've had from the very beginning of Good Wife. And he did Brain Dead. He did all the shows for us. And he's just very connected into the Broadway community. So he can grab actors either that are just out of Juilliard on Evil this last year. We had amazing actors who had, we were their first job. And it oh, was. Wow. Like, Hmm? Yeah, I, said, I know. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was really great that you're not just getting in the same old, same old. They're just, or it might be a 70 year old that you've never seen before. It's a great face, but also an actor that is doing amazing work. Um, I love seeing Wanda Sykes. Isn't she fun? Yeah. So much. She's fun. great. She's so funny. I, she just shows up on screen. I start laughing and she hasn't even said anything. 
<laughs> She's so great. Well, thank you for today. Thank you for hiring me season four, all of it. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you guys so much.